Now, in the last part of her summer journey, Angela Ripon travels further along the Kennet and Avon Canal into Bath and Bristol. approaches Bath, it passes through the village of Bathampton. It was here that the man-made canal was originally meant to join the River Avon, which has been running parallel to it for some miles. But because the river was prone to flooding in winter, they eventually decided to build the canal all the way into Bath. This is the Mercury, based at Bathampton, and at the moment it's being turned around, ready for a cruise. Run as a summer attraction by Marjorie and Steve Calvin, it's a trip with a difference, because this is one of the two horse-drawn boats on the Kennet and Avon. It used to be a cargo boat, and it still has the living quarters inside. Whole families started living and working on canal boats in the 1840s, when, because of the competition from the railways, the boatmen's wages were cut, and they couldn't afford to run a home on land or pay a crew. This was the kind of teapot that used to be popular on canal boats. In fact, it's called a barge teapot. During the day, the beds were folded away behind flaps. If they weren't, the tiny cabin would have been impossible for a family to live in. When the Mercury gets underway, she conjures up an image of this part of the canal in the middle of the last century when for about 20 years there was a twice daily passenger service between Bradford on Avon and Bath. It was a very efficient and successful operation. The nine mile journey took less than an hour and a half and there was often an added attraction on board, a small string band to entertain the passengers. The George Inn at Bathampton is one of the best known of the canal side pubs, but it's far older than the canal which cuts right through what was once its front garden. Parts of it date back to the 14th century. There used to be a factory here that brought employment and prosperity to the village for over 80 years. It's recently been demolished and a housing development built in its place. But the name of the factory is remembered locally with a great deal of pride. Harbutts. It was founded by William Harbutt, the man who invented plasticine, and he lived in this house which was right next to the factory. William Harbutt was teaching art in Bath when he devised his new kind of modelling clay, but he decided to go into business and manufacture it. So in 1900 he bought an old flour mill on the bank of the canal at Bathampton and turned it into a factory. Well, before continuing on to Bath on board the cruise boat, the John Rennie, I've arranged to meet one of his grandsons, Jack Harbert, who's brought along some of the family archive to show me. Now, to me, the remarkable thing about William Harbert's invention is that it's been used in so many different ways, and not just by children. War wounds have been dressed with it. It's been used to design cars and aero engines, and professional model makers of all sorts have blessed its properties but I'm somehow disappointed to find that Jack doesn't play with it anymore. No, I'm afraid I've passed it now, but I do find it terribly useful if I get a draft in the house around the windows or the windows rattling. A piece of brass that he's always at hand. <laughs> stops the draft and stops the rattling or it does all sorts of things. You know, keep your pen and stick your pen in the alongside your desk. It's got a hundred and one uses. I believe they even use it in the metal industry. Now, how was that? Well, the uh, British Iron Steel Research uh, found out that plasticine behaves like hot steel. They would uh, set up the plasticine strips of white, black and white 
and push it under extrusion and pressure to see what the molecules of the steel would do when they were actually being performed on. And I'm sure a lot of people don't realize that you can use plasticine not just for modeling, but for also making pictures, using it like oils and putting it on with a palette knife. Yes, it's, uh, it's not very well known that, although it, we have informed masses of people about it. Uh, whether anybody else has developed it, apart from our family, I, I, it's hard to say. But they do make delightful pictures. And it's got to be on a greaseproof base. And you usually start off with, say, a quarter of an inch of uh, white plasticine, then add your colors and your shapes and forms onto the board, onto the top of the white plasticine. But it still survives as a medium that children can play with and enjoy. Yes, most certainly. <laughs> The footnote to the story of Harbert's is that although plasticine is still made, it's now manufactured in Peterborough by the company that took the business over in 1983. Well, we're now entering the built-up area on the outskirts of Bath, yet the canal is still a haven for wildlife. And so, 57 miles after it began at Newbury, the central man-made section of the Kennet and Avon approaches its end. But before it gets there, it has a final flourish. It takes on a real air of elegance as it passes through Sydney Gardens. These were commercially run pleasure gardens, and to cross them, the canal company had to agree to erect four decorative bridges, in addition to paying the owners 2,000 guineas. Despite the attempt to hide it in a deep cutting, it was actually the railway with its noise and smoke that hastened the demise of the gardens. By the 1850s, customers had lost their enthusiasm for them, and the concerts and firework displays that had captivated Jane Austen became a thing of the past. Fortunately, the most attractive few hundred yards on the canal have survived intact. And there's more. This very ornamental chimney looks down over the Whitcomb flight of locks, which finally takes the canal down to the River Avon. The chimney is all that's left of one of the two pumping stations that once raised water from the river to the top of the flight. And there's one particularly notable lock. It's the deepest canal lock in Britain, with a fall of almost 20 feet. In fact, it's an amalgamation of two locks, one was lost to a road widening scheme in the 1970s. And then at the bottom of the flight, there's what remains of the other pumping station. The pumping stations were installed in the early 1830s, but they didn't work for long. Local mill owners pointed out that the canal company didn't have legal rights to take water from the river at this particular point, which is where the canal joins the Avon. When the architect John Wood planned his new city in the early 18th century, he was inspired by the forms and dimensions of prehistoric stone circles. But he carried out his plan in the classical style of architecture, which was very fashionable at the time. Indeed, his grand buildings were designed to be attractive to the greatly increasing number of people who were coming to stay in Bath to take the waters. The classical tradition of building that he started continued into the present century, and it served the city well. Today, visitors flock here to admire the work, not only of wood, but of others who followed in his classical footsteps. The pump room, for example, was built in the 1790s, 40 years after wood had died. And this extension to it, which doesn't look at all out of place, was built 100 years later. The wings of the Guildhall were also built in the late 19th century, and they harmonized quite happily with the 18th century block in the middle. But the last of the classical buildings came in 1927, the post office. Everything built since then has been decidedly anti-classical, 
which raises the question, which style of architecture is more suitable for Bath? Tim Mole is an architectural historian with a special interest in the city. Well, my feeling is that um, there is a chance here for modern architecture, but there's also a chance for classical revival architecture, which is modern, because that's what's being built today in places like Richmond on the Thames. And that's what I would like to see the planners um, take on, some classical revival buildings. But I think, in a sense, they're rather frightened. They have these fantastic buildings here from the past, um, and they're, in fact, too important for them to emulate. Um, and anything that they do would seem pale in comparison. And that really is the problem, I think, with planning in Bath today. Well, these are buildings that clearly have the stamp of the 18th century of them, and obviously modern architects want to put a 20th century stamp on what they build. What's wrong with that? Oh, well, there's every reason why they should, yes. The problem is, is that uh, their buildings don't match up in any sense to these. I mean, they're just not as good. They're not as well designed. And what I would like in Bath is to have new buildings, modern buildings, but buildings of very good quality design. I mean, the place deserves it. I mean, this is the place where tourists come, as we, we can see. Um, this is the place where people want to see good architecture. The problem is, when they actually come here on the train or to the bus station, their first sight of Bath, in fact, is very bad modern building. So yes, let's have modern architects making their stamp on the buildings, but let's have a little bit more diversity in the buildings. Let's have some classical revival buildings as well as modern buildings, particularly in the areas um, around the river that do need to be redeveloped. So what sort of buildings do you find particularly aggravate the eye? Well, there is one awful building, and that is the Bath Hotel, which is right on the river near the, near the locks at Widcombe. It's often the first thing that tourists see when they come to Bath, and it just looks like a block of council flats. Man-made materials rather than natural materials, jarring red roofs, very thin windows, metal frame windows, and it has this prime site right on the river that could have been developed to make a beautiful opening view for tourists to Bath, and that's what they see when they come to Bath now. And in a sense, Bath is a special case. It's not like Milton Keynes, and it's not like Birmingham, it's not like Liverpool, it's the classical Georgian city. And that's how it should be developed into the 21st century. And that's how I see it. Anyway. A classical city that had to earn its living, and the river was to become a highway for trade. From as early as Elizabethan times, there had been proposals to make the River Avon between Bath and Bristol navigable, but the plans had always been thwarted, either by the owners of the mills that blocked the river, or by other landowners, farmers, and even the merchants in Bath, who were worried that uh, cheap goods brought in by river would ruin them financially. So it wasn't until 1712 that Bath Corporation got an Act of Parliament that would turn the river into a navigation. Though it wasn't until 1724 that anything was actually done about it. In that year, the corporation handed over its interest in the river to a group of businessmen who immediately set about building the six locks that were necessary to overcome the 30-foot drop in height in the river between Bath and Bristol. And then at last, in 1727, the Avon navigation was open to traffic. The canal company realized that they needed to get control of the navigation, so they started buying up shares. And by 1796, they'd succeeded in gaining a majority shareholding. They went on to acquire all but one single share. Most of the boats on the river are cabin cruisers, but this marina is expecting a lot more narrow boats in the future, according to John Payne, who runs it, and is giving me a lift downriver. The Kelston Manor we see today was built in 1770, replacing an earlier mansion that, in Elizabethan times, was the home of Sir John Harrington. He came up with one of the first proposals to make the river navigable, but he earned a place in history as the inventor of the flushing toilet.
We're now approaching the lock at Saltford, where there are some fascinating reminders of the river's history. In the 18th and 19th centuries, this part of the Avon was famed for its brass production, and we can still see amongst the moored pleasure boats the remains of two chimneys which were part of Kelston Brass Mill. Articles like pans and bowls required annealing, slow cooling to keep the metal soft, and these chimneys were annealing ovens. The mill was located on the river because it needed water power to drive the hammers that were used to work the brass. On the opposite bank, Saltford Lock has an inn attached to it, the Jolly Sailor, and here the commercial boatman used to carry out a traditional ritual. Whenever a man had been made up to skipper, he would come in here and plunge the poker into the fire until it was absolutely red hot. Then he would push it into the wood surround of the fireplace to leave his mark. And you can see that this beam particularly is pitted with holes where men have done exactly that. And then, of course, he'd have to stand around and drinks to everybody that was in the bar. But there's another unique feature here, and it's the painting above the fireplace. Now, this shows the pump, the Jolly Sailor, the lock, and the river as they all looked in the middle of the 18th century and it is a remarkable historical record if you look here in the lock you can see there's a barge which has a sail on it now obviously they could have only used that when there was a fair bit of wind but imagine the speed they could achieve once they put it up if you look here on the bank you can see there are men pulling this boat not a horse now although they'd spent something like 12,000 pounds turning the river into something like a canal they didn't have a towpath for the horses. And so the barges on the boats had to be pulled by men, bow hauliers, who would pick their way over the rough ground and around the trees on the banks of the river. It was a very hard and poorly paid job, and one that men went on doing for some 80 years, because it wasn't until 1813 that the Kennet and Avon Canal Company got an act of parliament that allowed them to build a towpath. The disused line of the Midland Railway has been converted into a cycleway. It runs all the way between Bath and Bristol, and it was opened in 1982. One of the old stations on the line was at Bitten, and a group of dedicated volunteers have brought it back to life. They not only restored the station buildings, but they're also working continuously on various items of rolling stock, and of course locos that they've managed to acquire. It's been a huge task, but they've enjoyed rescuing this little bit of railway heritage for posterity. Most important of all, they've relayed more than a mile of track, so the public can now come and take a trip back into the age of steam. And the Avon Valley Railway, as it's now called, has an old association with the Kennet and Avon Canal. Before the Midland Railway took the line over in 1864, this was the Bristol and Gloucestershire Railway. And in the early 1830s, the Kennet and Avon Canal Company opened up a line that branched off it and ran down to a wharf on the Avon near Bitten. It was a horse-drawn railway, or dramway, and the idea was to get coal from the coal fields in South Gloucestershire onto the river. And it paid off because it reduced the price of coal along the Kennet and Avon Canal by as much as four shillings a ton. You could still trace the old branch line down to the river, but I must admit, the ride on a steam train is much more fun. The Avon flows on westward through the small town of Canesham. And one of the two main legends that the town boasts has its source in the parish church of St John the Baptist. Here there's a brass offertory plate which is said to have been donated by the great composer George Frederick Handel, who supposedly used to visit friends in the area. It's said that his inspiration for the Hallelujah Chorus came from the rhythm of the hammers in the local brass mill. Well, it's a legend that so far no one's managed to disprove. The other legend concerns St. Cana, a 5th century saint who probably gave the town its name. Her story is, as it were, written in stone in many of the local walls. It's said that the valley was filled with snakes when she came to live here, 
but that through her power of prayer they were all turned to stone. These snake-like fossils, however, are far older than St Cana, as Peter Crowther of Bristol Museum explains. They are, of course, the, the remains of once living sea creatures. And you must think of this whole part of southwest England as being submerged beneath a subtropical sea some 200 million years ago. And what we actually see fossilized in stone here is the, the infilled shells of what were once um, hollow ammonites. Now, ammonites became extinct some 65 million years ago, but we think we know what they looked like when they were swimming in this sea. Uh, around Cainsham because of uh, there are a number of living creatures around today to which ammonites were related, these being squids, octopuses, and the pearly nautilus. The shell itself was like uh, a buoyancy chamber, if you like. You, you, you wouldn't think it now because these things weigh so much having been turned to stone and full of rock, but in life they were essentially hollow. If we can have a look at this sectioned ammonite where you can see quite nicely the coiled shape and inside it's divided up into chambers. These have since been uh, infilled over geological time with the mineral calcite. So why are there so many of them in this particular area? Well, it's, um, it's partly coincidence. The, these large beasts, which made Cainsham such a well-known name in, in um, geology, um, are restricted to a particular period of geological time, around about 200 million years ago. The bedrock around Cainsham just happens to pierce those special layers of limestone in which these wonderful beasts are common. So as you can imagine, when they, when they were building houses in the 18th and 19th century from local stone, local quarrymen used to, when they were digging up the limestone, they used to find these, and often they were built into the houses themselves. Well, as you're the keeper of the ammonites at the Bristol Museum, how do you feel about seeing them embedded in walls and on the side of houses and garages? Well, we're lucky enough to have a very good collection of these ammonites, collected and donated to us over the last 150 years or so. So to see the odd one or two um, adorning local walls doesn't bother me too much. And uh, our stores are pretty, pretty full already, and these things weigh so much that I doubt if we could actually take any more. But they do look actually rather nice too, don't they? They do indeed. All too soon we come to Hannam Lock, the last of the 104 locks on the Kennet and Avon Canal. The 87 miles that we've travelled from Reading have been the responsibility of British waterways, but from this point onward, the Port of Bristol Authority controls the navigation. Hannam Lock may be 14 and a half miles from the Bristol Channel, but it's still vulnerable to the enormous tides that can reach up this far. And among the notices, there's one that warns boaters that it suffers from silting. It can also be completely submerged. Well, although Hannam Lock marks the end of the canal, it was never a commercial terminal. For most boats, Bristol was journey's end. And that's where we're now headed on board a very shapely craft called the Princess Anne. She's one of several boats that regularly do cruises on this stretch of the river. There's a bird. See the scone in the trees? The trip is educational too, because the owner, Derek Brockwell, gives a running commentary. On the right-hand side, you've got Riverside Cottages, which originally were quarrymen's cottages, built by the quarry master, whose name was Cooch, and they got the name Cooch's Rank. And then when the quarries closed, they passed into private hands. And um, as you can see, they've been beautifully done up to form frontage to the river. Um, although it looks an idyllic place to live, uh, I'd like to point out to you that, in fact, the river does flood and the highest recorded floods was in 67, when we had the water level up to the bedroom windowsills of the pub. It's funny how chance can play such a big part in great undertakings. For example, the Kenneth Navan Canal Company got an Act of Parliament passed in 1811, which authorised them to build a canal between Bath and Bristol, avoiding the river altogether. And it was only a temporary downturn in trade shortly afterwards that persuaded them not to go ahead with the scheme. 
The charms of the river come to an abrupt end at Cruz Hole, where new building developments are taking place. In due course, hopefully, they'll improve the look of this part of the river. Cruz Hole was once very industrial, and outside the local pub, there's a piece of machinery that commemorates that fact. It's a pump salvaged from the tar distillery that was established here in 1843. It was originally built to provide creosote for the sleepers on Brunel's railway. Within sight of the entrance to Bristol city docks, the large area once covered by the St Anne's board mills is also currently being redeveloped. The Avon now goes along an artificial channel for a while in order to bypass the docks, which back in the early 19th century were turned into what's called a floating harbour. Well, for the last lap of my journey, which will take me through the harbour, I've accepted an invitation to be escorted by the police. And to my surprise, I find that this police launch patrols between Bath, Sharp Ness and Ilfracombe. Constable Philip Russ is in charge of the police boats. He's the Avon and Somerset Force coxswain, and he works mainly in collaboration with the diving unit, recovering cars and property from the water, and, inevitably, searching for bodies. This stretch of water is the feeder canal that feeds fresh river water into the docks. William Jessop, one of the great canal builders, is the man who converted the docks into a floating harbour and that meant that ships could stay afloat whatever the state of the tide. But it didn't stop the gradual decline of what had for centuries been the second most important port in the kingdom. The harbour was eventually closed to commercial shipping in the early 1970s, and the two and a half mile long waterway has since become a much enjoyed recreational area. And so at the point where the River Avon takes over again and makes its way towards the Bristol Channel, our summer journey comes to an end. We've been travelling along the Kennet and Avon Canal, the most important canal in the south of England. But it's only one of many inland waterways now thankfully being rescued and recognised as a unique part of our national heritage. As for the future of the canal system in this country, well that undoubtedly lies in their potential for holiday and leisure activities, rather than as major transportational routes for cargo. But you know, I think that one thing that this journey this summer has shown is that where the Kennet and Avon Canal is concerned, after the new breath of life that's been pushed into it, it is going to go on providing an awful lot of pleasure for a great many people for years and years to come.